Today we need to stand for the reading of God's Word from the Gospel of John, chapter 8. And if you can't stand, that's fine. You can stand in your heart, maybe even close your eyes and give your attention to these words. Now I'm going to point out some verses. We're going to start in verse 12, but then I'm going to jump quickly to verse 31. Here we go. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you're truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they answered him, We're descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean saying that? we will be made free. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, anyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're descendants of Abraham, yet you look for an opportunity to kill me because there is no place in you for my word I declare to you what I've seen in the Father, in His presence. And as for you, you should do what you've heard from the Father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. But now you're trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are indeed doing what your father does. And they said to him, We're not illegitimate children. We have one father, God himself. And Jesus said, If God were your father, then you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here now. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. Now down to verse 52, 51. Jesus again says, Very truly I tell you, whoever keeps my word will never see death. And the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. And yet you say, Whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophets who also died? Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. If my Father glorifies me, he of whom you said, he's our God, though you do not know him, but I know him, if I would say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him. I keep his word. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. And he saw it, and he was glad. And then the Jews said to him, You're not even 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can find your seats. But don't get too comfortable because today is audience participation day. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to wait for an answer. So are you ready? What can you not live without? What is vital for you to live? Air, water, food. Cell phones. See, I knew someone would. That's right. It's okay to be funny as well. What else? Shelter. Yep. Power of God. God's Word. The what? Stones for throwing are vital? Boy, this is going to be a rough day. We saw how Jesus' sermon ended. (laughs) Thank you for that participation. That's what I expected. You know, when we talk about what's vital in our life, we could go back to Abraham Maslow's pyramid, right? He's got this pyramid, and 
At, at the bottom, it's those physical, physiological needs. Air, water, food. Just above it, the second one, are those things about safety and security, you know, shelter. And that, those two form kind of the physical things. But then he keeps going. And he provides three more things on there about being able to find belonging and love. About being able to be esteemed, that people would respect what you're doing. And then at the top, that you'd, have, you'd be self-actualized. You'd know who you are. You'd know what your purpose is. Now, you don't have to remember those things. You've probably heard them long ago in school. But basically, they split out as... There's physical needs. There's body needs, material needs that we need to exist. And there's also spiritual needs. Things that could be seen or, or visually observed, but yet they're more spiritual. They're more hard to actually put your finger on. Here in this story and in this time together, I'm giving you one answer to what you really need to survive. One answer to what you cannot live without. And I'm just going to tell you on the front end because you probably would guess it anyway. It's Jesus. The living, breathing Jesus. Jesus is vital. More important than anything else about you. More important than any friend in your life. More important than any allegiance that you might hold. And I really mean that sincerely. That you could invite Jesus into your business into the decisions that you make. You can invite Jesus into your home, the difficult things you have to decide with your spouse or maybe against your spouse or with your kids or maybe to try to correct your kids. Inviting Jesus to be the living presence there is what's most important. We're in the middle of a series called Life Light. And in this series, you might remember how we started weeks and months ago back in the very first verses of the Gospel of John. In fact, I kind of gave you a secret that if you want the cliff notes of the Gospel of John, they're all there in the first 18 verses. You could just go back there and look. And you might remember that I invited you to bring your highlighters. Bring as many colored highlighters. Do you remember this? And I gave you some words that you could mark. I'm going to show you what those words were on that particular day. They're not, they're not the only words, but they're the ones that I looked at. And these are words that if you wanted the Cliff Notes version of John, it's in the first 18 verses, maybe even in the first four verses, maybe even in verse four. And the words that maybe you can make out, the first one is red, the word, the logos that we're calling Jesus, the organizing principle in the world, or the one that I put in orange of life, part of our theme verse, theme title, about giving life to everything. And then light, there in yellow, that's pretty appropriate, right? The glowing, illuminating for our paths, for our life. Believing, trusting and relying upon Jesus, not just cognitively, but relying upon Him as a friend. And then finally, that word become that I've got in blue that literally means to be born or birthed, where you're becoming something. So I want to invite you to look at John chapter 1, verse 4. In Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all people. That's what we've been focusing in on. You see a couple of those words buried in that verse where we're looking to rely upon Jesus for everything. And in this Gospel, in this Gospel of John, all of Jesus' teaching, all the stories about Him, the discourses that He ha gives to people, the conversations and the dialogues that He has with people are all focused in on this idea of becoming the life light and believing and trusting in Jesus. I mean, if He's the Word, if He's the Logos, the organizing principle of the universe... He existed far before we saw Him in human history. Way before. And He's offering to us the life that created everything that is around us. A life that is recreating us day by day as we choose to live with Jesus. And today, I'm going to repeatedly be calling us to 
bring our anxieties, to bring those biggest questions that we have, those biggest frustrations to our friend Jesus so that we can not only survive and get along with the bare minimum, but that we might actually thrive. And the way I want to do with this, you probably picked up on the fact that these verses, just the few that I read, are kind of complex, right? The the stories it's easy to get lost in, you probably felt yourself even drifting off, even as I read to you in this just straight voice, right? Well, here's the way I want to do it. I want to give you four verses that will, that are important verses, they're vital verses that unpack some of the main themes of this entire chapter. Okay? And they're not the only important verses. They're not the only ones. They're the ones that I have picked out to share with you today. And so let's do the first one. The first verse that I read is verse 12, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Here's the background that I want to give you. In these chapters, chapters 7 and 8, it's in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. And Bryce did a great job last week of pointing us to this festival. And maybe you even remember that he pointed us to our own festival, Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta, right? Where you illuminate the balloons either at early dawn when they're about to take off or maybe you go for the glow or maybe you're seeing them in the early morning light where you can still see the beautiful colors and it's still dark outside. That's a great comparison for what this festival was. In chapter 7 and chapter 8, it's We get to this story, and it's the very last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And here's what they did on the last day. There were four gigantic lamps, huge. They'd send the young men priests to go up ladders to put oil inside of these lamps. And they had wicks in them, and the wicks were made up of the old linen of priest garbs. They were wound up and made into these gigantic wicks. And they would light them up on this last day, this last night, and it just was brilliant, so bright, like flares. Now, that might not mean anything to us when we think about, well, I don't know, Times Square in New York, maybe the Las Vegas Strip. It may not seem all that exciting to us, but it was stunning because there wasn't a house, there wasn't a courtyard that wasn't reflecting with the light in their window. I can hear kids saying, Mom, I can't sleep. It's too bright. What are all these lights outside? Because they weren't used to street lights or Times Square lights. And yet here comes the light. So Jesus has the audacity to stand in the courtyard and to say to everyone, I am the light of the world. Him. The light not just for Jews, but for the world. Now, when you look in Scripture, light is often referred to as God. Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2. Whenever you see a theophany where God appears, do you know what often is there? Light. Remember Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3? There's light and there's the presence of God. So when you talk about light, you're talking about very important things like God or the law. Or the patriarchs. And yet Jesus has the audacity to say, I am the light. And he makes it very clear. If you want to have your way illuminated, it's not going to come from Vegas. I don't think we needed a point on that, but it's not going to come from New York Times Square. Jesus says, it's going to come from me. I'm the light. In fact, Whoever follows me, says Jesus, will have the light of life. They will have all insight. They will have a way of looking at this world. And they will never, third claim, walk in darkness. So it won't be fuzzy. Life won't be obscure. It'll be very clear because you're focused on Jesus and nothing else. Everything else is seen in the very light of Jesus. Well, the I am the light of the world. We've heard that before. It seems like I've heard these I am statements. Those of you that have been around, maybe you've seen a poster or a cross stitch or something. I am the bread of life, right? I'm living water. I'm the gate. There are seven of these I am statements, and we get this one. 
And there, I am with a predicate. Oh, wait, Brady, don't go to English. Okay, I won't. Don't worry. We know what a predicate nominative is. You know, it's the, the, the noun that's the object of the verb, right? So, I am the bread. And here in this case, he says, I am the light of the world. There are other times where Jesus says, I am, but there's no object. It's just, I am. And that's very interesting because that's a code word. He's doing it in Greek. He's not saying it in Hebrew, but the code word is for the very name of God, which brings us to our second verse for the day. This second verse comes to us in verse 59. I'm actually jumping to the very end. I thought, you know, sometimes you have to go to the climax. You have to go to where you're going. You have to read the last page of the novel to know it's going to be okay. And then you can go back and travel forward. Well, in this, in this verse, Jesus says, before Abraham was, past tense, I am. And it's at that point that they pick up stones to kill him. What? Why? Okay, so he's making some theological point about being before. Why, what? I don't care. It doesn't make sense. Well, it's a big deal for Jews because he is claiming not only to pre-exist Abraham, to be before Abraham, but then he throws in, I am. He is using the secret code word name for God. The name that when Moses was at that burning bush, he says, okay, so I'm supposed to go get the people out of Egypt, and you're this God from a fiery bush that's telling me to do it. Can I tell them who you are? Can you give me your name? And God says, I am. I am that I am. I will be who I will be. I've existed. I will always exist. I am. And so they never spoke that word. They were very careful about it. Sometimes you could even get killed for just flippantly saying the name of God. You didn't put it on clothes. You didn't put it on signs. In fact, even in Scripture today, there are 6,000 references where Yahweh is placed, and you'll see the all caps Lord. Have you ever wondered why that's there? That's because that's that secret code word name for God, and they would say, Lord, Adonai. Well, before Abraham was, I am. Now maybe you can begin to see why they were ready to kill him. Because he uses that code word, and he uses it seemingly for himself. There are three times in this very chapter that he says this I am, and they don't catch it until this last one. That's the one they're going to kill him for. Verse 59. The first time he says it is in verse 24, where he says, you're going to die in your sin. You're going to die in separation from God unless you believe that I am. They didn't catch it then. In verse 28, he says, you will... Know that I am when you lift me up. Ooh, that's a little interesting. When you crucify me, when you kill me, when you execute me, you will know that I am. It almost sounds like a judgment or like a punishment. But I think it's a promise. Where Jesus is saying, yes, you're going to do away with me. You're going to lift me up. You're going to kill me on a cross and you'll think I'll be gone. But only in that moment will you begin to see what true forgiveness looks like. That this God that we've called I am shows us what love is like through the kind of action that Jesus will do. Well, I probably don't have to tell you that whenever people claim to be God or even insinuate as much, we think they're crazy. And that's what's happening in this very story. They think he's crazy, and yet Jesus is saying, I'm the light. I'm the way to see everything. Which brings us to our third special verse that I'm highlighting today. This one's in verse 29, and, and I might have picked several. I might have picked verse 38. But in verse 29, Jesus says, I do what pleases the Father. I do what pleases the Father." Two things that I want to say about this. And the first one is Jesus' use of Father. That may not catch us wrong because we're quite familiar with it, but for Jews, it was very unusual. You didn't call God Father. Yes, you can look in the Old Testament. You can find many times where God is called Father. He is likened to a Father. He is compared Father. There's only a few where you could almost say, 
Well, maybe he's being addressed as father in the Isaiah passages. And yet, it's not until Jesus, where Jesus says so frequently that this is his father, that we begin to call God father. In fact, in verse 42, he says that if God were your father, essentially, if God were your dad, then you would love me. They don't like this. They don't like Jesus using Father to refer to God. In fact, in chapter 5, verse 18, it says the reason why they were ready to kill him is not because just he was breaking the rules of the Sabbath, but in chapter 5, verse 18, because he was calling God Father and making himself equal to God. Well, Jesus opens up the door for us to relate to God in this same way when he teaches us how to pray, our Father who art in heaven, to address God, to call upon God in this very intimate way. He's opening up the door that we can seek God in this way as a friend. Okay, the second thing I want to say about this special verse, about doing what is pleasing to the Father, is what he, what he seems to indicate about Abraham. Because he begins to point the finger at them and says, you don't do what your dad does. You just don't. In fact, he really insults them in verse 39 when he says, you don't even do what your father Abraham did. You're trying to kill me. I don't know if we can see how double standard what goes on in our mind and our heart is versus what we do and say. Or we can be trying to catch someone in a religious error or that they're not practicing in some way. And then on the inside, we just want to destroy them. We want to murder them. That's what's happening here. They're trying to catch Jesus in His words to trap Him. And they're planning His death and His execution. And He knows it. And He says that's not the way it should work. In fact, He says, I I can't believe that they say it. It makes me laugh. They say, we're slaves of no one. And you're going to make us free? We're slaves of no one? Have they forgotten? Can you not name off some of the countries? Well, let's see. There was Egypt, and then there was Assyria, and Babylon, and Persia, and they're currently enslaved to Rome. We're slaves to no one? Jesus says in verse 24, whenever you are given to sin, to separation from God, you are enslaved to sin. You're stuck in a life that's going nowhere. It's leading towards death. And what Jesus is trying to communicate is I don't care if you are Jews. I don't care what your DNA is. I don't care who your ancestor or forefather is. How are you acting like your father? Now, we've never said this to our children, have we? Yeah, I don't care if you're related to me. You better start acting like we want you to act. This is what Jesus is saying. And it's not something that he's just saying to Jews. Can you hear me, church? This is not about tearing down the Jews of our day or the Jews of that day. By no means. In fact, we have to hear today Jesus' words to the Jews as words to us. Words whenever we're not acting like the Father that we claim. And we say, well, yeah, I show up at church. I'm I'm a believer. And yet our life is so far removed from those moments that we might spend in church. Or while we might check a box on a census about what we believe. That's not it. It's not communicated in those. It's communicated every day by the friendship that we have. And so it's not anti-Jewish at all. In fact, it's inviting us to hear these words just like the Jews would have heard them. And to realize that maybe we're not being as attentive to God as we can. Well, that brings us to the fourth verse the one I'll spend the least time with. This is verse 31. He says to those Jews that believe in Him, if you continue in My Word, in My Logos, remember that from the table of contents? In the beginning was the Word. The Word is Jesus. The Word was with God. If you continue in the living Word of Jesus, you are My disciple. If you want to know what holds this whole universe together, if you want to know what has the power to hold your life 
together. If you want to know what can give you a way of looking at your entire family and your relationships, it's understanding that the organizing principle of the universe is the living Word. It's Jesus Christ at work in you. This one who says, I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of the world. I'm living water. I'm all of these basic necessities of life to keep you alive. And to really take serious what that looks like. That it's not just something that we talk about. It's an ethic. It's an action. It's a way of living in this world. Jesus, if I could say it in just a couple of words, is our life light. He is the one who gives life and light to everything about us. So let's get very, very practical now. I've talked about Jesus being a friend to you. I've talked about the intimacy that you can have with God by calling Him Father. And there are basic necessities in life like food and water and air and light that we have to have. And there are some times when our life is so strained that even those basic necessities are strained. So what I want you to imagine, if you're in that situation where that bottom foundation of the pyramid of not having those physical things is in question, I want you to not only imagine yourself, but to actually go to Jesus and to sit down with Him and to say, I need help. I need food. I need water. I need shelter. I need the basics in my life right now in order to survive. I mean, if we really believe that Jesus is our life light, why would we go to anyone else first? To ask Him and to say, will you give me what I need in this moment? Because Jesus claims to be present in the now. And you can go. It's not just something that we claim. It's not just some stuff written about a fancy feast and from a leather-bound book. It is an actual way to live. Well, let's imagine your business. Difficult things in your business, choices that you have, and you think, I just don't that I can explain this. Sit down with Jesus and explain it. You think he doesn't know the math? You think he's surprised by the relationship that he doesn't know the people in your business? You think he can't sort out computer code? I'm deadly serious about this. If we don't think that Jesus has impact on our life, then we're not living as Jesus called us to live, where he is our life light where we can sit down and we can explain to Him and pour out our hearts to Him about our business, the most complex things that we're facing, the difficult circumstances, the relationships. And you know what hap- will happen? You can imagine that Jesus is listening there very patiently, maybe even asking a question, nodding and understanding. And it may get to the end and He may say, He may have some other questions that are more pointed. So why is it again that you're doing this with your taxes? Tell me again why it is that you're letting this person go. Jesus didn't just say things for us to think about, but He is involved in the details of our very life. You think your family life is too complex to sit down with Jesus and to explain it and say, this is what I'm grieving over. This is what I'm hurting. This is where I am banging my head against the wall as a parent, as an adult child of an aging parent, whatever it is, and lay it out before Jesus and say, I need help. Invite Him to come in and do what He says. Do what He suggests and do what He guides. Same thing as a student. You're a student in school and you're like, I hate school. I can't wait to get out of school. Folks, School is one of the best gifts that you get. Even your worst teachers, the worst environment, worst school. There's so much that you can learn. It's not about hating that. But invite Jesus into your frustration about school or the test or the exam, or maybe it's just the people that you're having difficulty relating with. Invite Jesus to provide change and transformation. The living, breathing Jesus. Listen to him. As he says, there's some habits in your life that need to change. There's some ways that you talk with people that maybe you shouldn't do anymore. There's some words and some anger. There's some things that you're doing that are not good. There's some physical ways that you harm people that you shouldn't be doing. 
and listen to Jesus and actually do what he says. Don't just come to word and say, oh, you know, it's so cute that Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Isn't that pretty? Let me get a cross stitch and make a light bulb or maybe a, a sunshine. Isn't that just a beautiful metaphor? No. Sit down at the desk of your life and flick on the light because so often we're sitting in darkness trying to live our lives all by ourselves and we won't turn on the light. We won't let Jesus illuminate. We'll turn our attention to anything and everything else. Google, this country, what people believe about things, we'll turn on anything and everything except the light of the world. Here at First Christian, let me tell you who we are. We follow Jesus. If you've got some other people that you need to follow, by all means, we follow Jesus. He's the light of the world. In fact, the most important thing that I could tell you is that God made you and that God loves you so dearly and that God wants to live in you and with you with your life. And that's what we're about. We're not very good at it. We're all struggling and trying and sorting out things in our own relationships. We're trying to figure things out, but we are doing what Jesus did because that's what he taught us. We're listening to those things that he said and we're trying to live them out. Let's pray. God, thank you for being the light of life. And Father, today we just confess that we so often go into the interior room of our home, into a closet, and we sit in darkness, and we try to scrawl out answers on a piece of paper to school, to business, to our family. And God, we ask that you radiate your light into our hearts and lives, that you beam it like a skylight into our closet and radiate out to this world your light. Thank you for the life of Jesus and thank you for the life that you've provided us through Jesus, the one who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.